I don't know what you've done. Can I just remove this? It's, in, it's interfering with whatever is going on here. I don't know what you've done there, but uh, no, it was off. The projector is off. Okay. I'll politely ask that. I don't know what you did. But uh, just plug it in, but just be careful. <laughs> All right, sorry about the uh, inconvenience. Try and see if uh, I've actually gone down there to, to see if I could get the keys to the um, the Odell lab instead, but hopefully they'll fix this issue with uh, furniture or something. I'm told there are renovations going on, uh, whatever that means. All right. I hope this is good enough. I hope we can. You, you couldn't find seats this side? Sorry? Oh, but you have told them we have class or something. And you third year. <laughs> so, okay. Um, sorry about that. So we can start, I suppose. Uh, we're a bit behind here, but uh, sorry, Ngatamlemona. Uh, this is the best we can do. Right? <laughs> My my bamba is a bit rusty. I'm really good at chow and nyanja, but <laughs> but anyway, so so we can we can start, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about that. Um, so we're transitioning to lecture series number two. But before we we start, I thought I would, I would uh, remind us of uh, of what what is actually going on currently. So I sent out an email to the class in regards to assignment number one, which is due on Friday, I think. Um, it's, it's a simple thing. It's something that you can do in one hour, right? In less than an hour. So it's, it's an individual assignment. What you are required to do is you're required to form groups of four. Okay? Um, you want to do this by, by Friday, right? It's four, right? Nothing like five here. It's four. Four individuals. Um, yeah, so the deadline is obviously March 17th. What you want to do is you want to speak to people, right, and find out if they'll be keen to work with you or something, right? Uh, sell yourself and tell them what you are able to bring to the table, as they say. But anyway, uh, we've had very strange people in the past who struggle, right, to just form a group. Please don't be that person, okay? All right. Uh, and then the, the upcoming assessment is just going to be, again, simple, but it's a group-based assessment who we'll ask that you pick a topic, a desired topic that you're going to work on, right? Uh, in consultation with your fellow group members, ideally. This will be open on Monday, I think, or Friday. Anyway, so today's lecture series, which is lecture series number two, is structured as follows. I thought we'd do something very different this year, right? Start with a case example that will hopefully enable people to gain a better understanding of what we're doing, right? So the case example, I'll just briefly walk you through the case example. Um, and then at some point, we'll discuss the generic software process activities, right? 
So essentially, we walk through the software development lifecycle, that SDOC lifecycle I spoke about in our most recent uh, lecture series. And then we have a lengthy discussion of software process models, right? So we'll briefly look at some of the most widely used software process models, right? So your traditional model, your, is it your waterfall model? Uh, we'll look at evolutionary prototyping, you know, uh, rapid application prototyping, agile techniques, um, so that you have a better understanding of what sort of approach you can take given a software-driven uh, project. And we'll have a discussion of how we go about coping with change, and then we'll discuss process improvement. So how we improve uh, the processes associated with whatever model would have chosen, right, to use, to execute the project. All right. Um, so in terms of the case example, I'm just going to briefly, uh, briefly outline the problem, right? So incidentally, this uh, case example is, is a project that I've been a part of. Uh, we started working on this project in October of 2022, which was, was last year. And um, we were only, we were ideally supposed to finish executing this project in December, the second week of December or something. But we only managed to finish everything, I think, uh, last month it was, right? <clears throat> Uh, so, so I thought I would use this as an example, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll just briefly outline the problem and then uh, gloss over the solution description, what we did, what we proposed to do. And then to, to, to set the stage for our subsequent discussions, I thought it would be important for me to explain the process that we followed. And hopefully this way uh, you, you'll be able to appreciate what we're doing. Normally, right, colleagues that are enrolled in this course will struggle to figure out what's happening. So I thought maybe starting off with a case study would be a good thing. Right, so the, the Jesuit Center for Theoretical Reflection, I don't know how many of you have heard of JCTR, but, but I'm sure you've heard of the, is it the Basic Needs and Nutrition Basket, the BNNB, right? That document that is produced that um, outlines approximately how much money is required for somebody to survive in, in certain towns in the Republic, right? Uh, they were in the news recently when they actually <coughs> uh, told us that I think the, the BNNB value for Osaka is somewhere in the 9,000 or something, right? 9,000 quarter. A family of five, they call it, right? Mom, dad, and I, I suppose three children or something, right? Um, so it turns out that they, they do quite a number of things, right? Um, they're a non-government organization, but they normally source for funding, right, to execute a series of projects. Now, these are research-centric or research-based projects. One of the projects is the same BNNB project, right? So the way that they, they compile that BNNB report is they go out there in the field, and part of what they do is, I guess, they dish out a survey, right? And sometimes interview individuals. Uh, it turns out that there's uh, an exercise that they con conduct that complements the surveys that they give out to marketeers, right? People that sell in the markets to find out you know, what is the price of carpenter, you know, uh, how much does roller meal, is it, I don't know if it's 10 kg or 25, 25 bag of roller meal cost, for instance. They'll also conduct what they call, is it a satellite household survey as well. So they'll randomly choose uh, households that they visit, right, and they conduct extensive interviews, right? And a few other things that they do. Now, it turns out that um, if you look at the broad spectrum of things that JCTR does, right, there is data being collected, right? there is data being compiled when they're analyzing the surveys, for instance. <clears throat> and um, as it turns out, JCTR did not have infrastructure in place, right, to help with the organization and processing of the data, right? And so what they decided to do is they decided to embark on a project, right, to set up or to implement what they are calling the research data management infrastructure, right? Um, so they put out a call, right? Usually this is a starting point. If you're in the business of developing software, what will happen is you'll be on the lookout uh, in the newspapers or something, right? So an organization, an entity will advertise to say, we're looking for somebody to develop software, right? And then people will send out bids or proposals. Um, now, this bid document that they circulated, it's on their website, I want to go to jctr.org.zm, um, they are clearly outlined things that they were expecting, right? So the expectation was that the consultant was going to identify the gaps and opportunities that exist in so far as the design and implementation of this uh, RDM infrastructure was concerned, right? Um, and then the next step is the consultant was supposed to 
create an RDM framework, right? Uh, and then more importantly, I guess the part that uh, you'd be interested in is the consultant was supposed to implement the RDM framework, right? So design and implement it, actually write code where applicable or uh, configure software where applicable or something. Of, of course, train people, right, on how they would go about using this RDM infrastructure. It's a typical process, right? You develop so software for people, you, towards the end you prepare user manuals, right? Uh, and then you conduct training, orientation training, so that people know exactly how to use a piece of software. Especially if it's an obscure piece of software, not easy to use software like WhatsApp. Nobody had to train you on how to use WhatsApp here, right? Uh, so anyway, so this is a problem specification, right? Um, and I apologize that I use this as an example, but uh, it's something that we did recently and things we did are still fresh in my mind. But I think in an ideal case, maybe what we should have done is we should have uh, used a very easy example something. It turns out that uh, there are a number of software components that were implemented here, right? But anyways, uh, so the, 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 the question to ask is, what, what sort of shape and form does this, the implementation of this framework actually take, right? Well, <clears throat> it turns out that one of the things, right, that JCG I was ex expecting is that we would, yes sir, Oh, okay. I hope I'll be able to, I think I can see here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that JCT I was expecting is that the solution, right, be aligned with standard best practices, right? So one of the things that they were expecting is that whatever infrastructure would be implemented would be aligned with the so-called uh, 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 research data management lifecycle, right? So this diagram that you're seeing here. So ideally when you set up an infrastructure, an IDM infrastructure, it's supposed to enable whoever is going to be using that infrastructure to plan, right? For whatever research is going to be taking place. Uh, they should be able to document, right? Um, protect the data that is being generated. Uh, what is here? Be able to store and manage this data that they're collecting. Um, ensure, right, that the data where applicable is openly available, right? To the general public. Yeah? <clears throat> Want to be transparent. And of course, this notion of long-term preservation of data or information, right? So there has to be some sort of guarantee that the information that has been collected is going to be available five, 10, maybe 20 years from now here, right? So the preservation. It turns out that there are <clears throat> steps that you can follow to guarantee preservation of information. Some of these things actually we discussed in 1110 during uh, secondary storage, if you remember, right? Replication and redundancy when you're backing up information, for instance. Uh, but there's other things in the mix, like uh, making sure that you properly describe the information, uh, that you document the file formats and software tools that are being used to generate certain files, right? So if you generate a document using Excel, or rather, well, I guess, yeah, Excel 2010, right? Somebody 10 years or 20 years from now should be able to, to, to know, right, what sort of application is used to generate that that document. In the, in, the, in the event that they want to access that, that, that data and they don't have the software, right? <clears throat> no likelihood, I mean, people won't be using Excel 2003, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, that's what we're saying. But anyway, so, <clears throat> so we had to align <clears throat> what we are doing with this, uh, with this life cycle. And then also, fair, so-called fair principles had to be taken into account. And mostly these fair principles really are tied to um, the eventual public sharing of, of data publicly, right? Uh, so this notion that whatever you're sharing publicly should be findable. In fact, not just the information you're sharing publicly, but also this data that you are storing, right, for internal consumption, should be findable, right? So if somebody is looking for a document, they should be able to easily find the document. Uh, generally, this would be through search and browse, right? <clears throat> it should be easily accessible. It should be interoperable, right? So if there's a third-party application that needs to consume data from whatever infrastructure has been set up, uh, that shouldn't be a difficult thing, right? So you know what this means. Implementation of web services, for instance, or APIs, right? And then obviously, uh, data should be reusable. <clears throat> but anyway, just trying to, to, to outline, hopefully this is going to enable you to understand what was being done, this solution description. Um, in essence, if you look at your typical RDM um, uh, framework, right? It's composed of three main parts, right? So there's research planning, or three main aspects. There's active state of research, and then there's sharing of results. So whatever project that JCTR would find themselves running or executing, 
at some point they would have to plan to undertake that project, right? At some point they would have to manage the active state of research, right? And then at some point they would have to share the results that have been generated, right? So this is where the BNNB report comes in, for instance, right? Uh, or the satellite household survey or something. Um, here, right, you can think of what goes on here, like if you are conducting a survey and you issue questionnaires, right? You have raw data that you are collecting. You probably use fancy tools like SPSS, right, 2034, to, to analyze the data, right? Come up with fancy graphs using Excel. There are intermediate um, files that are being generated, right? Yeah? So it has to be managed in a certain way. Anyways, so it turns out, right, that there are different sort of um, software components that would be required to handle all these different stages, right, of your typical IDM uh, framework, <clears throat> right? So what we did is we ultimately decided that um, we're going to use a series of tools, right? So for research planning, we um, decided to just take the approach, a simple approach where we would use um, <clears throat> a DMP tool. It's a platform that is freely available, right? Um, and then for active set of research, the initial idea was we, we had actually recommended, strongly recommended, um, that they use an already available uh, platform. We recommended Google Drive, right, Google Workspaces. Uh, they were a bit hesitant because, uh, and I, I think this will come up uh, at a later stage, but they were a bit hesitant because it was going to be costly for them, right? You must look up how much it costs to to subscribe to a Google Workspace account, right? Would you appreciate this? I think when we, we did this, it was, uh, I could be wrong here, but it was somewhere around, is it $36 per account per month or something, right? That's all the sort of money that JCTR has lying around, right? And so eventually what we did was we, we actually implemented a, uh, a custom digital asset management system. So ideally the digital asset management system um, handles the active state of research. And then for sharing of results, there's a, there's a repository platform, right? Um, so the digital asset management system looks something akin to this. Uh, you can probably go, I don't think you'll be able to access it, <coughs> excuse me, because uh, it's password protected, right? But you can go to dams.jctr.org.zm, right? So that you have an idea of what we're talking about here. Um, and then for the repository, right? Uh, you can go to repository.jctr.org.zm. So the thing here, right, is what we're trying to say here is um, when you have, when you're presented with a problem, right, when you're presented with a problem, usually you will be presented with a problem, right? A client will come to you. Sometimes you wake up and you think to yourself, there's this problem I've identified, I'll come up with a, a software and hopefully people will use it and I'll make money from it. But standard practice is somebody will have a problem and they will approach you either explicitly or implicitly. Can you develop software, right, to solve this problem on my behalf, right? Your job is to carve out, right, a solution, right? So you come up with a solution, and hopefully there'll be a point in time where you're going to present that solution, and if they're happy with the solution, then they'll say, you know, it's fine, you can do this work for us, you agree on things like how much money is going to be paid to you, right, when you do this work. Nobody does this sort of work for free, right? Um, Right, so it turns out that for you to, to get uh, from stage one up to the final stage where you actually implement software, right, there's a series of steps that have to be undertaken. There's so many things that happen, right? Um, and generally what, what you start off with is you come up with a plan, right? right? A plan on how long is it going to take you, right, to get to this stage where you actually deliver the product. Right, that's one thing. <clears throat> but also, uh, who else are you going to work with? Right, when you're working on large-scale projects, you rarely work alone. Right. Um, the other important things, like you'd have to identify things that can go wrong. Right. So risk management. Well, if I'm working with uh, ten other people uh, somewhere down the line, right? If you're saying you're going to do this between October and, and December. Uh, Maybe somewhere in, in November, somebody just comes up to you and tells you, um, I'm leaving the project because I found something better, right? Maybe you're not paying them enough money or something. People get sick, right? Sorry to say this, but people die, right? This is life. So 
you have to plan for all of those things, risk management. But of course, I mean, there's the whole range of other things that you have to do, right? Um, in fact, as part of planning, you have to systematically, right, decompose the project. So this is a very vague description, right? A client comes to you and they're telling you this is what they want done. This is very vague here, right? You must decompose this project in such a way that you identify individual tasks associated with the things you're going to do, right? Um, the reason why you'd want to do this is it turns out that it becomes incredibly easy for you to ascribe time, like how long something is going to take if it's a very small task. If it's something that can take less than a week, you can easily assign time there, right? Like if I was to ask you here, right? say, how long do you think it would take you to implement the research data, manage, uh, the research data management uh, infrastructure, right? You'd come up with a, a guess or something, but it'd probably be way off here, right? But when you decompose the project, it becomes a lot easier for you to assign times. Not only that, when you decompose a project, you'll be able to easily figure out how many people you will need. Because you're making a promise to somebody to say, we're going to do this between October and December, right? Obviously, you can't, you can't work on such a large-scale project alone right, between October and December. So this time here, right, is usually derived from, from uh, a work greater on structure, but this is a gun, a gun chart, right? Uh, so you, you, you specify who is going to work on which task, right? How long is it going to take them to work on, on that task, right? And then you come up with a nice timeline, right? with specifics on, oh, the inception report is going to take us a week, right? So we shall send to you an inception report, right? Which is a deliverable. Um, and usually these deliverables are tied to payment plans. So usually when you're working with a large scale project like this, it's not like uh, they'll say, uh, we will pay you once you do this work. No, right? Maybe the agreement would be that 10% is going to be paid once you deliver the inception report, right? 20% is going to be paid once you, you you're done with requirements analysis, and the remainder perhaps will be done, well, maybe the next percentage is going to be paid once you, you're done with implementation, and then finally, once you're done with training, you decommission the project, will pay you the remainder, right? Well, obviously it's important for you to get paid because when you hire people, people won't work for free, right? People expect that you are may, maybe paying them every month or something, right? And things of that nature. But anyway, so planning is important, right? Um, not only that, right, when it comes to implementation of software, one of the things you'd have to do is decide on an approach you're going to take, right, to execute the project, right? So there are so-called software process models, right? Um, established best practices that guide you, right, uh, on what series of steps you should take and how actually you should execute those steps, right? This is an uh, iterative model, by the way. And so our, our interest really in the course is to hopefully understand what we need to do when you have a problem, right, so that you get to a stage where you deliver the software, right? This is the essence of uh, software engineering, right, what we are doing, and project management. There's a whole lot of project management here, right? Somebody is late, persistent, what do you do, right? You just don't fire people, right? You need to learn how to manage people, right? Um, hopefully this case study gives you an idea of uh, what's happening here and, and hopefully when you think about these other software uh, applications that you use, you have an idea of um, the stages, right, or the things that people have to do, right, for them to deliver that product. This is how SIS was implemented, right, this is how Moodle was implemented, this is how WhatsApp was implemented, this is a group of individuals that will work together, right, typically hundreds of people, right. Uh, there's another example that I'm probably going to sneak in. I was fortunate enough to have been, um, I'm fortunate enough to be part of, uh, there's a, a technical committee for UNSA. I think I mentioned this. So UNSA is uh, working towards implementation of the, an H HRMS, or Human Resource Management System, slash payroll system. Because it's becoming expensive for UNSA to spend money using a paid for service, right? So they, they, I think they make it a license subscription every year, very expensive. I don't know what sort of platform we use here, but it's becoming expensive. So what they've decided to do is, we have uh, CICT, CICT has a, uh, is it a systems development team or something? Highly qualified developers, right? People that implemented SIS. If we have those people that are paid every month, why can we not bring them together, right? So that they build an 
HRMS system. So I'm going to sneak that in, I think, uh, as, as another example so that we have a mix of different, um, different types of projects, right? Uh, but, but what you notice as we are, have, as, as we are going to, uh, you know, go to subsequent topics is that the things that you do are sometimes dependent on the type of project you're working on, right? The sheer size of the project. I mean, some software applications are, they're, they're trivial, right? They're not like the toy projects you're going to be working on. They're not very complex, right? Anyway, so this brings us to our discussion of the generic processes, right? When it comes to the design and implementation of software, the generic processes that you have to execute, right, for you to develop, design and develop the software. And this is the questions about the case example. I hope it's clear, right? Right? Uh, so it turns out really that uh, <coughs> uh, the, these so-called software processes are generated, this is an important point to note here, they generally interleave, right? They interleave sequences of technical, collaborative, manage uh, and managerial activities. Uh, there's usually this mistake that people like you will make, right? You assume that what you do here is just uh, associated with programming. No, right? Risk management has nothing to do with programming, right? Project planning has nothing to do with programming, right? Or project management has nothing to do with programming. Team management, right? Group cohesion, those things have nothing to do with programming, right? <clears throat> so uh, it turns out a series of technical, collaborative, and managerial activities and in an ideal case, right, when you're working as part of a larger group, you're working on a large-scale project, you typically have people that will play dedicated roles. Like, for instance, there'll be a dedicated project manager, right? Their job is just to manage the project, right? They're paid to do that. You have a dedicated team of developers. Their job is to write the software, right? Uh, a dedicated team of quality assurance engineers. Their job is to test the software, right, once you're done with implementation. You have a dedicated team of business analysts. Their job is to, well, gather the requirements and hopefully come up with uh, a specification, a form of specification that the programmers will do, right? Some of those things are technical, some of them are not, right? The issue of co collaboration is important. If you're working as a, a part of a larger group of 20, 30, I mean 100, uh, 100 people, right? How do you work with those people, right? Oh, scratch that. If you're, if you're, if you're a programmer, you have to, to be a programmer and there are 10 other programmers. Well, there are nine other programmers, there are 10 of you. How do you collaborate together, right? So these processes that we're describing, right, have aspects of all of these things here, right? But the overall goal, really, right, <coughs> the overall goal of these interleaved sequences of technical, collaborative, and managerial activities is, is really to specify the problem, come up with a formal specification of the problem, design the solution, right, um, of course, come up with implementation, you write the source code, right? And you comprehensively test to ascertain if what you have done corresponds with what this client said they wanted, right? We want an RDM infrastructure. How do we know that what we've done, in the, how do we know that this thing here we did? How do we know that this is actually what, uh, what JCTR wanted, right? Somebody has to test, right? Um, and in fact, the test, testing starts early on in the implementation process, right? When you're writing the code, right, the debugging you do, that's unit testing, for instance. And also a series of activities that are performed here. Um, <clears throat> right, and, and it turns out really this, the, this series of activities can be clustered into these different things, right, when it comes to software development, right? <clears throat> so you'd start off with requirements engineering, right? Uh, sometimes it's called analysis, but requirements engineering, I prefer to use that. And then you have software design, you have implementation, testing, and evolution. I always use this example, right? And people think it's a joke, but I always use this example to say, if you go around the city or these other towns in Zambia or something, right, across the country, uh, the one thing that everybody is doing here is, oh, I'm building, I'm building, right? Um, you can view the building process similar to developing software here. You will have people that will decide to build a house, right? Maybe a two-bedroom house in such a way that the first thing you do is you just say, I'm going to look for a bricklayer, right? I tell the bricklayer I want a two-bedroom house, and that's it, right? But what's, but, and, and this is how you end up, by the way, this is how you end up with problems like, oh, house is flooded, right? When it rains, it's flooded. But there are people that are smart enough to say, what I will do is I will hire an architect, right? You know? Um, I will make sure that I involve all these crucial people to come in and 
do the assessment, right? just don't drill, a, if you're looking at drilling a bore, you just don't randomly drill a bore, right? you have to plan for those things. Um, that planning is important, but what we're saying is you can't build a house without really going through this process, just like you can develop software, right? Without systematically performing these activities we're going to study, but chances are the thing that you're going to end up with is going to be buggy, right? And in fact, it will, it will in no way be aligned with what people are expecting, right? The next thing you know, a week down the line, people are calling you, right? This thing doesn't work. This feature is missing. Why? Well, maybe it's because you never did an extensive requirements engineering exercise. You didn't even bother to go and gather requirements or engage the stakeholders, right? Relevant stakeholders. But anyways, so in essence, these process activities can be clustered into uh, requirements engineering with specification, development, validation, and evolution, right? So there's a series of things that happen here. Um, a point to note here is that these things will tend to be organized. The way that you execute these activities is dependent on the software process model that you choose, right? But the generic activities, right? So when you decide to use the waterfall model, the traditional model, uh, the way that you execute these activities is different from when you decide to take an agile approach, right? Or if you decide to leverage, uh, uh, I guess, uh, is it uh, evolutionary prototyping, for instance, right? Different things that you do. Um, <clears throat> Um, but you, you, but one, of, one of the things that would be expected of you is you must settle for an appropriate software process model, right? That's, well, maybe not you, but maybe business analyst or something, or the project manager, right? You decide on what works best. And we'll look at uh, things, right? Traits or characteristics or factors that you take into account for you to decide on whether you're going to use a uh, waterfall model or agile development. So things like... Uh, if, if uh, scope is well defined. Generally, if you're migrating from, uh, you're migrating to a new system from an old system, the scope is already defined, right? You already know things that you have to do. Then you do, you make use of the traditional waterfall model, right? But if you're a bit uncertain, if you're working in a domain that you're not familiar with, right? Somebody from the bank gives you a, uh, a project, right, to work on. You don't understand the financial sector, right? The regulations that exist in there. Maybe uh, the best if you took an agile approach, right? An iterative approach. Anyway, so look at all these different uh, factors, ideally. Right? And uh, hey, hopefully you now know that uh, just because you did 2010 doesn't necessarily mean that you'd be able to uh, come up with a high quality product, right? The obsession with software is <clears throat> success criteria. Um, you must be able to execute the the project, the software-centric project, within the agreed time frame, right? Within budget, right? And the quality has to be aligned with the expectation of your customers, right, or your clients. <clears throat> and if you plan systematically, you realize that you'll be able to easily do these things, right? Quality, time, and money. Nobody wants to work with somebody who will initially tell you, well, this, uh, the cost of this project, the total cost, right? Overhead and everything else, what we're expecting you to pay us is going to be 500,000. And then somewhere midway down the project is saying, we can't continue here because 500,000 won't be enough here. We, we need one million quarter, right? You understand? So you have to plan for those things. But anyway, so on with it. I mean, if we look at these different stages, so we're, we're just glossing over these different stages. We have dedicated lecture series where we study requirements engineering, design, you know, aspects of implementation, testing, but nothing here than deployment plans, right? <clears throat> uh, believe it or not, I mean, there's quite a number of things that go on here, right? Like one of the things we did with the JCTR project was sat there, right? <clears throat> um, it's simple things that people would take for granted, like uh, secure connections, right? Instead of HTTP, you want secure co connection, and HTTPS instead, right? So things like, um, how do we, do we want them to access the repository, right? Well, subdomain, right? Hmm? Repository.jcti.org. How about the dams, right? Dams.jcti.org. Um, it's trivial things like, what platform are we going to deploy these services on? Right? What operating system are we going to use? You know? What web servers are we going to settle for, right? Nginx or Apache 2 or something, right? Ubuntu, this is Windows Server, and all those things, right? Now you see that 11.10 is coming back to bite us, right? 
right? The type of operating system. Because the client, they won't tell you that we want you to deploy this on Linux, right? It's your job as a person who's working on this to say, the deployment plan is as follows, right? We're going to deploy this on a server with these sort of specifications, right? Uh, you know, it must have a minimum of X gigabytes of RAM, right? The storage, how much storage, minimum storage do we need, right? Because you have to take into account future expansion, right? You know, you don't want a situation where they are calling you, this thing doesn't work, and then you realize that a month or two months down the line, you just run out of storage space here. You didn't plan, right? So there's quite a lot that goes on under evolution deployment. I just wanted to mention here. Um, <clears throat> incidentally, we ended up, uh, uh, these are hosted on the cloud service, right? Uh, <clears throat> host these on new old servers. It's cheap, I guess, I don't know. But also we're working with people that, um, uh, deploy most of their services on Linux servers. So I think that's one of the reasons we set out for that. But these are things to think about, right? Um, and things that you might think are trivial, right? The implications, if, if some of these applications um, store sensitive information, personal identifying information, you know from your computer security that there are regulations in place in this country, right? Right, like the Data Protection Act of 2021 will tell you, or tells us that you are not allowed to host or to store personal identifying information outside the boundaries of Zambia, right? So if you're working on an application that's going to be storing banking information, like where you have a name, account number, and you know, I don't, I don't know what, what other, how is it the address where somebody stays, or patient details, then you know that whatever application you're developing must not be deployed outside the boundaries of Zambia. So forget about Amazon Web Services, or Google Compute Platform, or even Greenode here, right? Because you'd be going against regulations that exist. Now, you know what most Zambians would do, right? Just because uh, uh, nobody has gotten arrested for jaywalking, you just randomly cross everywhere, right? But it's always nice to do the right thing. You don't want to be used as an example, all right? Um, so anyway, um, <clears throat> so series of things that you have to do. Very first step is uh, requirements engineering. Uh, and it turns out that requirements engineering, right, is actually associated with a broad spectrum of activities, right? But fundamentally, what some of the things that you do as part of requirements engineering really is the very first thing you start with is, uh, I was going to say requirements elicitation here, but I think the correct thing to say here is that the first thing you start with is stakeholder analysis. Sorry, what's that? Is it time up? No. Uh, so the first thing you start with, right, is stakeholder analysis. Um, so stakeholder analysis, what you do is, you, so you win the bid, right? <clears throat> you prepare your project charter or your inception report, outlining what you're going to do, who's going to be working on the project, and you know, the, the software methodology you're going to use and all those things, right? Project charter is different from the proposal here, but you prepare a project charter. First thing that you do is, as part of requirements engineering, is you do a stakeholder analysis. You are required to identify all the different entities that have a vested interest in what you are doing, right? <clears throat> Everybody, right? Irrespective of whether they are going to be using the system or not. It turns out, right, some of these systems that are developed or have direct users, people are using the system, but, uh, but other interested stakeholders that may not use the system. Think of Moodle here, right? The VC doesn't use Moodle, right? Or, no, doesn't, right? VC doesn't use Moodle, right? Because <laughs> it doesn't teach, right? You understand? But they have a vested interest in Moodle, right? It's a stakeholder, a key stakeholder, right? Um, if you are developing a very sensitive application, right? Maybe these days, common applications are financial applications, right? Or an application that can easily enable you to send mobile money or something. Well, there are interested stakeholders, like the central bank, for instance. You understand? They have a vested interest in what you're doing. Those are all stakeholders, right? So you do a stakeholder analysis where you identify everybody who has a vested interest in what you're doing, and then using a subset of those stakeholders, you identify people that are potential sources of requirements. Who amongst your stakeholders are you going to approach to elicit these requirements, right? So if you think of Moodle, for instance, obvious people will be approaching to go and elicit requirements is what? Students and lecturers, right? 
right? A student who, who use Moodle by logging in, submitting an, an assignment, a lecture, who log in and upload materials and all those things, right? Anyway, so after your stakeholder analysis, you identify people that you can elicit requirements from. Then you start the elicitation process, right? Requirements gathering or elicitation. Uh, I think uh, elicitation is a fancy word for gathering, right? I don't know if it's technical here. But I don't feel fancy by using the word elicitation, but maybe some people feel very important that you're using. <laughs> it's not me, this is what's in literature, right? Elicitation or requirements gathering. Right? And what you discover once we have a dedicated discussion of elicitation is that there's actually a broad spectrum of techniques that you can take advantage of for you to elicit those requirements. And uh, the good news is that uh, most of these techniques are similar to these techniques that were introduced to you in 2034. Ooh, focus group discussions, questionnaires, interviews, right? Workshops. Because all you're doing when you're gathering requirements, you're collecting data, right? But you want to be smart about collecting data here. The data you're collecting has to be aligned with the system that you're building, right? It's, it's not like you're going to go there and you're collecting how tall are you, right? But when you're implementing Moodle, what's the point of doing that, right? Uh, but anyways, so we'll have a, a dedicated discussion of requirements elicitation process. Hopefully you'll get an appreciation for that. But it turns out, right, that um, the next sub-step as part of requirements engineering after elicitation, so stakeholder analysis, requirements gathering or elicitation, the next thing you do is you come up with this formal specification, right? Because the information that you collect here, right, the way you represent this information is not going to be useful to a, a technically inclined individual, right? Like a programmer, right? Or a quality assurance engineer, software tester. So you need to um, represent the requirements you elicited in a formal way that um, a programmer, for instance, would be able to understand, right? So requirement specification. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, right, <clears throat> I, I guess one of the uh, important things to note here as part of uh, requirement specification, that specification document will have sections that are uh, meant for consumption of your clients or your customers, <clears throat> and a section that is meant for a programmer, for instance. So there will be a section where you have those fancy artifacts like the use case diagrams, right, or your activity diagrams, <clears throat> or your class diagrams, for instance. Think for a second here, right? If you are developing, uh, you go to JCTR, right? JCTR uh, will, will not know what a use case diagram is, right? They won't know how to interpret that. They'll be interested in a section of that document that describes um, uh, the requirements in an easy to follow manner, right? <clears throat> so the document will have a user and system requirements idea. Uh, and we have a dedicated discussion, by the way, where we look at uh, the different formats uh, or templates that you can use to uh, present these requirements, how you go about presenting the different types of requirements, so functional requirements and non-functional requirements, right? You must specify uh, this application is designed to run on a Unix operating system. Very important, right? You know this, that when you download a .exe file, you can't install that application on your Android phone, right? You know, most of these applications are meant for a specific target platform. That's a non-functional requirement. Moodle has a mobile app and the web app, right? Nobody cares whether you're using a mobile app, at least I don't, whether you're using a mobile app or a web app to access Moodle, right? If you wish, you yourself can develop another client, a desktop client, right, to access Moodle. It doesn't matter whether you're using a desktop application, a web application, or a mobile application, right? You're still doing the same things. The type of application, right? The nature of the application, that's a non-functional requirement. So if somebody comes to you and say, I want you to develop a mobile app, that, that's a non-functional requirement, right? Develop a mobile app, right? It has nothing to do with the functionality, right? I want you to develop an application that will be available 24-7, right? Because people are going to be using this to transact, right? People will be drinking, they'll be outside the country, their time zones are different, and they still want to transact, right? So that application must be available 24-7. That has nothing to do with the feature set of the application, right? It's a non-functional requirement. But anyway, so we'll look at exactly how we represent non-functional requirements and functional requirements. Of course, I mean, there's other important things that 
you take into account, right, as part of requirements engineering. Like for instance, validating the requirements, right? Somebody comes up to you uh, and tells you, uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, thing here. Well, I want you to develop Moodle and I, I want the student's parents to be able to also log in on behalf of the student or something. You validate the requirements, right? To see if they are realistic. So it's a weird example, but part of the validation is are their requirements realistic, right? Realistic enough such that you should, you should be able to implement, right? Because what you're doing is you're translating this formal specification into functional code. So can you translate all these requirements, right, into functional code? If you can't, then, you know, as part of the validation process, you have uh, discussions with your client or customers, and you explain this is not possible, right? Um, <clears throat> and of course, I mean, there's other things like prioritization of requirements, all part of requirements engineering, right? You order the requirements, right, in order of importance. Um, this becomes important, especially if you're taking advantage of agile techniques, right? Where from your product backlog, you pull maybe the end most important features, right? And you work on those features, right? Um, anyway, interesting things. So I'll pause here, and then we will continue looking at the time people are completing here. We'll continue this discussion, uh, I think it's day after tomorrow, is it? Uh, thank you very much. I, will, I don't know if I've responded to uh, we've had this discussion about the <coughs> alternative slot, right? I think I shared my free slots. If not, I will share with the, with one of the course trips. Uh, my Mondays are, my Mondays and my Wednesdays are somewhat good, uh, so we can find a slot for the missing, missing session here. Yes. What time? Yeah, what time? Oh, okay, I'll leave you to do this thing. <clears throat>